afternoon, <clears throat> and welcome to the Easter service for the Brian Bible Church in um, April the 12th, 2020. We uh, count it a privilege and a joy to be able to have the technology to be able to share God's Word and to continue to fellowship together in these unique days. And uh, we count it a privilege and a joy. Um, the, the opportunity to minister, we're, we're preparing this for our church family, but of course with the technology that we have going up on YouTube, we can make these things available. And uh, we appreciate our church family, love each and every one of you. And those of you that are not part of our church family that might be watching, we count it a privilege and a joy to share these things with you. And what I would like to do today as we focus on the resurrection, the glorious event of our Lord's conquering of death and, and rising on the third day, is share some unique things about the resurrection as it relates to God's Word and the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Before we do that, we have a special guest with us this afternoon. Um, those of our church family will know uh, Brother Richard Ferner. Um, he has some physical limitations and he's not able to be out and about as most. And he's also doesn't ha has limitations as far as computer and YouTube and uh, Facebook and all those other things. So I have Richard on my phone. And so Richard's going to listen along with us as we uh, have our message today. But before we do that, I'd like to give Richard an opportunity to say hello to our church family. So, uh, so just a second there. Richard, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, you're on. No pressure. <laughs> Happy Easter, everybody, and everybody stay healthy so we can get together again. Okay. If you'd like to say hi to Richard, do so and uh, he'll imagine the congregation saying hello to him. All right. Richard, we appreciate you, and uh, we uh, uh, just value your friendship, and I know I speak for everybody, that uh, you're a real encouragement to us. So uh, enjoy, our, enjoy your time as you listen to our message. I'm going to take you off speaker, and uh, you'll be able to follow along with us. All right. Okay. Take your Bible and open up with me to the book of 2 Timothy this afternoon. And uh, whenever you're watching this, uh, we, we're going to have it set up so it can be watched uh, Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning. But with the, uh, the technology of YouTube, these things can be watched at uh, many different times. And many people are watching their own uh, church services this morning. So perhaps you might be watching at a later point in time. Um, but we trust that these things will be a blessing and encouragement to you. Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, 2 Timothy chapter number 2 is a marvelous and a very important statement by the Apostle Paul. We could title the book of 2 Timothy, Famous Last Words. It is the final written revelation of God's Word as it's completed in the canon of Scripture almost 2,000 years ago now. I realize there's other books of the Bible that follow after it in the canon of Scripture, but chron chronologically, it was the last epistle, the last written revelation from God Almighty. And the Apostle Paul himself says it was given unto him to fulfill or to complete the Word of God. And um, so these are the last words of God to us as well. And there's some marvelous things about the ministry of the Apostle Paul in relationship to all of God's Word. And here in 2 Timothy, there's a famous verse of Scripture that, uh, that we, that are, that's near and dear to our heart, isn't it? Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, the Bible tells us to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There are natural divisions and distinctions. There are things that differ in God's word. And we recognize those distinctions not to cast any portion of God's word aside, as though it were irrelevant or of less importance, but rather to put it in its proper place. Because right here in 2 Timothy, he also says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and reproof and correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good, work, all good works. We have God's written revelation so we can enjoy and profit and be taught and instructed and reproved and corrected by all of it. And yet, in 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul says there needs to be a rightly dividing of the word of truth. Recognizing and putting things in its proper place 
in relationship to God's plan and purpose as it unfolds. So here in 2 Timothy, one of those distinctions that's pointed out for us here is the distinctive ministry of Paul, the apostle, to the Gentiles. Paul was not one of the 12 apostles. He, he was raised up not just to pick up the ball that the 12 apostles dropped because they never got out of Jerusalem as far as the account goes, but rather he was raised up to reveal a new purpose. What we call Christianity began with the ministry and the commission of the Apostle Paul out among the Gentiles. And there's a transition to that. And, and so we need to recognize how unique Paul's ministry is. And if we don't do that, there is great confusion because the Bible then is mixed together and those divisions, those distinctions, are not recognized, resulting in great confusion. Paul says here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, notice verse 7, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Think about what I'm saying here, Paul tells Timothy, and the Lord will give you understanding in all things. There is a, there is a, a sense where recognizing the ministry and the, 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 the truth that the Apostle Paul conveys in his 13 epistles will increase our understanding of God's Word. He says, consider. Then he says in verse 8, remember. If you have to remember something, it means it's important. He says, consider it and remember, Timothy, that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Now, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the great linchpin in Scripture. But the Apostle Paul, like he does with so many other things, adds or, 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 or envelops, enhances things already revealed in God's Word and gives added perspective to it. And so when he says, remember that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead according to my gospel, that's a very, very important statement. We know what the gospel that Paul is preaching here, and, and his gospel was unique. And what I want to do in, the, in a the, the, the first few moments of our time together is show and compare the way the Apostle Paul proclaims the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as compared to the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a familiar portion of Scripture all about the resurrection that is going to be that is preached all around the country and all around the world uh, this weekend. Uh, a glorious passage all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. You notice how Paul refers to himself here? He's not magnifying himself. He's just talking to the Corinthians about what he preached to them. He preached to them, which they also received. They received the message that the local church here, of course the whole city of Corinth did not, but those believers that responded and believed his message, he says, which you have received, they trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and wherein ye stand. Receiving the gospel, believing the gospel, gives you a standing today in Christ, in grace. He says in Romans chapter 5, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We have an, a, a perfect, complete standing before God when we trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. The doctrine of eternal security, once saved, always saved, Many people question that. Could it possibly be forever? Yes. He says, in fact, in 2 Timothy, he says, If we believe not, yet he abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. The, the doctrine of eternal security is, is debated today because it makes a difference where in the Bible you're looking at verses of Scripture about salvation. 
It's one of those distinctions that need to be recognized. And the Apostle Paul, in, in his message, conveys the fact that when you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are sealed under the day of redemption. You have total forgiveness, absolute, complete righteousness, and are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're not put on probation. God takes you and makes you one with His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a glorious truth. But you know, if you're reading in other parts of the Scripture, that perspective isn't always true elsewhere in the Bible of other people. It makes a difference where in the Bible you're reading. So Paul here says they received the gospel and they stood in the gospel. He says in verse 2, By which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now, he is not saying that you have to continue to remember that Christ died for your sins and was buried and rose again the third day and believe that in order to maintain your salvation. No. The, the word saved in the Bible sometimes refers to different types of salvation. In 2 Timothy, it says the, the husband and the wife, are uh, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and love. with some, you know, You're not saved simply by having a child, bringing, bringing a child into the world. It's saved from the, from the deception of the world. It's a different kind of salvation. He says we're saved by hope, saved from despair, and so on. It's that type of salvation here. You're saved from despair and confusion and you can rest in hope if you keep it in memory. Don't forget it. It's kind of like what he says over there in 2 Timothy. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. And here Paul defines his gospel. Verse, verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul says, that's my gospel. That's my good news that I preached unto you. You guys received it, and now you stand in it. Keep that in memory. Remember. So what I want to do is I want to, for just a few moments, compare Paul's gospel here as he preached out among the Gentiles to what Peter preached about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost. So go there with me. Go to the book of Second, or go to the book of Acts, chapter number two. Acts chapter number two takes place 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the Lord has spent 40 days with his disciples, and he has ascended up to the Father's right hand and told the disciples to wait for the events of the day of Pentecost to transpire where they would receive an outpouring of, of God the Holy Spirit upon those believers. And Peter, Peter is preaching that great sermon on the day of Pentecost to the nation of Israel in Jerusalem. Now, I want to use our PowerPoint here just for a moment. So um, we have a, a, a timeline that we use, and a timeline is just a tool where you, where you put different events in perspective to each other. That is, what happened first, second, third, fourth, and so on. And so we have a timeline here. We see the Old Testament and prophecy in the nation of Israel pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ coming and dying on the cross. Even his, his, his burial and his resurrection was spoken of uh, in, uh, in the book of Psalms, for example. And so we see time passed brings us to the, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ 50 days earlier from Peter here on the day of Pentecost. Jesus dies on the cross. He was buried, and he rose again the third day, spent time with his disciples, and then ascended up to the Father's right hand and sat down. And as he sat down, he pours out the Spirit on this little cluster of believers here on the day of Pentecost. According to prophecy, God said these things would happen in the last days of the nation of Israel. And so we're right here in that context here in the nation of Israel. So 
with these things in mind, the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, ascended at the Father's right hand, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ had to do, and the goal of his resurrection was that he would sit on David's throne, he would return back to the earth and establish his kingdom as Israel's Messiah here on the earth with its capital city being Jerusalem. That's the focus here in the second chapter of, of the book of Acts. Um, Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 22. Peter says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. See, it was his plan all along. It was part of the plan God laid out from before the foundation of the world. Notice how Peter talks about the cross here. He says, He was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. That doesn't sound to me like good news. It's good news for us as Paul talks about it. But right after the event, as Peter is talking to the nation of Israel, he doesn't call it gospel. It's an indictment. It's a crime that the nation of Israel, they missed him. They should have recognized him as the Son of God. They had said when he was crucified, we'll not have this man to reign over us. Crucify him. Crucify him. He was rejected by the majority of the nation of Israel. A little cluster received him. But here, notice the cross is not good news. The good news is that God raised him from the dead and is going to give the nation of Israel another chance to receive him. Notice, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, verse 24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it wasn't possible that he should be holden of it. Oh, that's, the, that's, the, that's good news. The nation of Israel killed the Lord Jesus Christ. They rejected him. They, they, they turned him over. They insisted that the Roman authorities crucify him and put him to death in open shame there on Calvary's cross. And the Lord Jesus Christ hung there on that cross. And you know what he said? One of the last things he said was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They don't realize what they're doing. And the Father answers that prayer, doesn't forgive them of all of their sins. What he does is he doesn't hold that sin accountable to that generation right then and there. He does something marvelous. Here in the book of Acts, he gives the nation of Israel a second opportunity to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah. God raised him up. And Peter in verse 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29 there, says, David talked about him. David said, Thou wilt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. And God raised him from the dead. And they know it. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was an established fact. He was seen of above 500 brethren at once, Corinthians tells us. The empty tomb, the, 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 the grave crows, clothes laying there, the silent soldiers. You know, the soldiers, uh, they, they should have been put to death for the, for the, um, for the, the, the failure to keep that tomb secure. But um, they, uh, they weren't put to death. Um, there was money that was passed under the table to the authorities that, that, that uh, kept those guys' mouth shut. They knew the tomb was empty, um, and so on. Anyway, another, another um, proof of the resurrection. Anyway, P David says, David talked about him back in the book of Psalms. Look at verse 30 of Acts 2. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God hath with an oath to him of that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to do what? Sit on his throne. There's the great Davidic covenant of the Old Testament. God made a promise to David way back in, in the book of 2 Samuel that because David had a heart for the Lord and David was a man after God's own heart, 
that God would perpetuate the seed of David and there would be a king that would sit on his throne forever. David knew it wasn't him. That's, that's fulfilled in, in the Lord Jesus Christ of the seed of David. And the Lord Jesus Christ was to sit on David's throne in a restored kingdom to the nation of Israel wherein perfect, absolute righteousness would prevail here on this earth. That was Israel's hope. Verse 31, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up whereof we are witnesses. That's the, the, the resurrection is good news because you couldn't keep him down. You killed him. You tried to get rid of him, but God raised him from the dead. And Peter's going to make, a, make an invitation to the nation of Israel to again recognize Jesus Christ as Israel's Messiah. He says down in verse number uh, 36, after talking about the Lord Jesus Christ making his foes his footstool, making his foes his footstool. If you look at, look at our chart here just for a moment, once again, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back in flaming fire taking vengeance, he is going to destroy the enemies of the nation of Israel and rule and reign in that kingdom with, with righteousness. He, Psalm 110 calls it the day of his power, the day of his wrath, a glorious time there. And, and so now he says... In verse number 36, Acts 2, 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. See, how, see the indictment continues there? He doesn't tell them Christ died for their sins, according to the scriptures. He says, you killed him, Israel. The good news is that God didn't leave him in the grave because it wasn't possible for him to be... God raised him because his purpose was to, to make him the Messiah that you rejected, that he was going to sit on David's throne. And that's your hope, beloved brethren. He, he's saying, all the house of... Your hope is that Jesus Christ would sit on David's throne. And he's the Lord, he's Jehovah, and he's Christ, he's the Messiah, and it all comes together in Jesus of Nazareth, that man who you rejected. Now, Peter talks about the cross, but it's not good news. The good news is the resurrection, and now Israel's going to have a chance to receive their Messiah. Notice what he says. He's the Lord and he's Christ. Verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Here's Peter's gospel invitation on the day of Pentecost. Then Peter said unto them, Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. No, that's not what he says. He says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Change your, the word repent there means a change of mind here in, in the scriptures. Um, take this Jesus of Nazareth who you thought was an imposter and recognize him as Lord and Christ in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, Christ the Messiah, and he's the Lord. <laughs> he's the Son of God. Listen, that's a gospel invitation today, but that's not the gospel Paul talked about over there in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, is it? Paul says, my gospel is that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. We know it's by grace you are saved through faith, and not of yourselves. There's a different program being discussed here. We don't have time to get in all the details of all of this, but the, the, the issue of remission of sins there, he also says baptism was important too, by the way, uh, because it was a ceremonial cleansing for the nation of Israel. No, topic of another time. But notice, he says that you might receive in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. I want to make a point for you here. You know there's a difference between remission of sins and forgiveness? Remission of sins means to pass over the sin 
It's not blotted out and wiped away. It's just passed over for a time here. It's kind of like the difference between being cured of cancer or having your cancer go into remission. You know, if, you have, if, if your cancer goes into remission, you still got it, don't you? And it's still going to get you. It's just its symptoms are not being prevalent. And you're, you've, got a, you've got a little bit of a reprieve here. Forgiveness of sins. I want to make a point here. In the, the program that's taking place here, Israel's forgiveness was yet future. Um, as, as we think about the second coming of Jesus Christ, on our, on our time chart here, which our camera person will sh shortly show us, <laughs> At the second coming of Jesus Christ, that is where Israel's sins are blotted out. They're remitted up until that time because God has some wrath remaining for the world and for the nation of Israel. You're here in the book of Acts. Go to Acts chapter number 3. As Peter preaches a few days later, same issue. He says... He says, for example, in verse 14, you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life whom God hath raised from the dead. See, they killed him. God raised him from the dead. Still an indictment, still a crime. The good news is the resurrection, though, because he was going to sit on the throne of David. He says, look at verse 9. Repent ye therefore, uh, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. <laughs> Notice verse 19. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things. You know what the time of restitution of all things? It's there in that kingdom. Jesus Christ is going to send Jesus Christ. God is going to send Jesus Christ and the times of refreshing. The curse is lifted and Israel's sins then are blotted out and totally wiped away and totally forgiven when they finally receive their Messiah as their king and as their kingdom. That's prophecy. And he says in verse number 21, prophecy, it says, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. God has had, a, has had something that he has been talking about since day one, that uh, there's a time, there's a kingdom going to be established on the earth, and, and there's going to be Israel's Messiah, and he's going to reign in righteousness and justice, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. That was the great message at his birth. And so we see prophecy has talked about this and spoken about this since the world began. Go with, with me to the book of Romans, chapter 11. Let me show it to you again. And you can leave our camera where it's at. <laughs> We've got to, coach the, got to coach the cameraman a little bit here. Romans chapter 11. Notice verse 27 of the, the 11th chapter of Romans. Paul says, for this is my covenant unto them. God made the covenant with the nation of Israel. When I shall take away their sins. You know what the covenant and when their sins were going to be taken away? Verse 26, and so all Israel shall be saved. As is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Israel's sins are taken away at the second coming of Jesus Christ. They're blotted out. They're remitted up until that time because God still has some judgment for them. And some, some, some tribulation and some time coming. But their sins are going to be blotted out and wiped away at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Glorious thing there. Look here in Romans chapter 11. That was 2000, almost 2,000 years ago. The kingdom hasn't come. Jesus Christ isn't sitting on the throne of David. He's sitting at the Father's right hand on his throne till his foes be made his footstool. God had something up his sleeve, I could say. 
Romans chapter 11, verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this, notice it, mystery, that lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. You know why Paul says, consider what I say and the Lord give thee understanding in all things? Because God interrupted prophecy and revealed a new program to another apostle. He was Saul of Tarsus, made him Paul and sent him out into the Gentile world with a message of grace to all men everywhere. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ was still the key. He was still the person upon which all of this blessing was going to center in, but he's presented in an expanded and different way. And the, the Jewish people, Paul writes here in Romans chapter 11, that they stumble and fall, and he, he set them aside temporarily until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. There is a wonderful new purpose. When Paul says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, Paul takes the resurrection of Jesus Christ and talks about it in an expanded way. Come with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 13. Acts chapter number 13. Acts chapter number 13. And verses 37, 38, and 39. The Apostle Paul talks about the Lord Jesus Christ in a, in a marvelous new way and offers forgiveness of sins as a present possession here and now. Not something here and now today in the dispensation of grace you realize we have the opportunity to be forgiven of our sins right now we have time past that's prophecy we have the ages to come that's the future the apostle Paul talks about an interruption now in the prophetic program and a marvelous new purpose that's revealed to him in the age of grace. Look at Acts chapter 13 and notice the difference. Understanding and knowing what else Paul says over in the book of Corinthians about Christ dying for our sins was buried and rose again the third day. Paul too preaches the resurrection. Verse 36, for David after he had served his own generation by the will of God fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Paul talks about Jesus Christ being raised from the dead as well. But now Paul, here he's preaching in a synagogue in Antioch, but he's also been preaching out among the Gentiles his unique perspective on the resurrection and some things that God can now do out among the Gentiles and Israel's kingdom and his second coming and the wrath that was going to be poured out on this earth foretold in the book of Revelation not foretold, John actually watched those things John was transported in the future and saw all of that all of that is put on hold well, God is doing something marvelous today and the resurrection of Jesus Christ means some things to us especially to us Notice how Paul proclaims the resurrection here in verse 38. He says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren. Now he's preaching to some Jews in a synagogue. And a few verses later, the whole city and the Gentiles come to hear this message too. There weren't any Gentiles back on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost was a Jewish feast day. The city was filled with Jews coming there to worship on Israel's feast day. It had to do with prophecy. But notice what Paul says in verse 38 here, Acts 13, 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you 
the forgiveness of sins. Not the remission of sins until a future time, but the forgiveness of sins. You know, when your debts are forgiven, you don't have to pay them up later. You're not just receiving a grace period, an extension of time to make it good later on. Forgiveness is the wiping away of the debt. Here, Paul doesn't say, you're going to get your forgiveness out in the future. You've got it right now. Through this man, Jesus of the seed of David, according to the flesh, just like he said over in Timothy, he's raised from the dead, but now through this man, you can receive forgiveness of sins right now. Isn't that good news? Oh, my friend, peace with God today in an uncertain world is possible when you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. He wipes the sin debt away completely and totally. In fact, Paul in the book of Romans says God doesn't even write it down anymore. <laughs> He's not up there, Romans chapter 4, verse 7, writing it down on a chalkboard, and then you confess it, and he wipes it away and restores felt. No, no, no. <laughs> Our forgiveness is complete and total through this man that God raised from the dead. Notice, through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And, you mean there's more? <laughs> this isn't an infomercial. You know, you're watching 1995, you get the gizmo or the gadget. But wait, there's more. <laughs> there's more here. And, verse 39, by him all that, all that believe, Jew and Gentile alike, all that believe are justified from what? All things. See how the forgiveness is total? See, forgiveness is wiping away the debt, and all things are forgiven. Justification is the putting in our account of his very righteousness given to us as a free gift. Paul goes on in Romans chapter 5, talks about the gift of righteousness. You know what it means to be justified and have peace with God? It means you're, the negative is taken away and God deposits the very righteousness of his son to our account. It says, God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God takes us today and puts us in living union with Jesus Christ and we receive his life and forgiveness and righteousness right now, the moment you trust him. That's why he can say the Corinthians who were so carnal and divided and arguing and squalling among themselves, he could say they receive the gospel and they stand in the gospel he says in the book of Romans, by whom also you have access by faith into this grace wherein ye stand. Listen, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. You say, wow, that's almost too good to be true. No, it's true and it's good <laughs> because God's grace made it possible because God was satisfied at the cross. And because God was satisfied, he was a propitiation. And because he put the old program on hold temporarily, he offers the riches of his grace to all simply by believing that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. That's good news, beloved. That's the gospel that Paul preached. Peter preached a gospel on the day of Pentecost, but it wasn't the same message. It was the gospel concerning Israel's Messiah and Israel's kingdom and Israel's last days, but those last days were put on hold. And today, we have the riches of God's grace in a new program and a new purpose through the risen, glorified, and ascended Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And the resurrection means that you and I
can have complete and total forgiveness now and have righteousness put to our account and stand in grace and have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that, that's great news in an uncertain world. And here we see by him are, that all that believe are justified from all things by which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Religion won't do it, will it, beloved? <laughs> no, it won't. Because if, if you have to keep the law or commandments or do this or do that, you'll never be sure if you did it all, did enough, or did it just right. But you know that Jesus Christ, when he hung on that cross, he did it just right. He did it all. He satisfied God. And God doesn't hold that against us. Our sin put him there, but our hands didn't. <laughs> But in the second chapter of the book of Acts, the wicked, unbelieving, and ignorant hands of the nation of Israel, wicked hands, delivered him up according to the purpose, but they still did it. And it was a crime that Israel had to recognize they committed. And that Jesus of Nazareth, who they said, we will not have this man to reign over us, they had to recognize that that man was both Lord and Christ. That's why in the Gospels it talks about believing in His name. They had to recognize who He was. And their forgiveness was future. Their righteous, they, were going to give, they were going to be given white robes of righteousness in that kingdom and rule and reign as a kingdom of priests. You and I, beloved, we get righteousness right now. We get total forgiveness right now. And we stand in God's grace because of the finished work, the death that paid it all, the burial that proved he was dead, the resurrection that proved God was satisfied, that was, he was seen. The event took place. We have some meaning of the event. You're here in the book of, book of Acts. Go to the book of Romans. Notice how Paul talks about the crucifixion. Romans chapter number 4, verse 25. Romans chapter 4 and verse 25. He says, who, who was delivered for our offenses. You know who the hour is there? It's everybody. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. He's out preaching among all nations. This epistle was written to the Roman believers thousands of miles from Jerusalem. He was delivered for our offenses. He was delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God. Israel with wicked hands crucified him. Here's the meaning of that. He, was, he gave his life a ransom for all, not just his people, but all to be testified in due time delivered for our offenses, and was raised again for our justification. We get righteousness right now <laughs> when we believe, when we trust him. That's why he says in chapter 5, verse 1, I've been quoting this, <laughs> therefore being justified by faith, Romans 5, 1, we have peace with God, not through our confession, not through our trying our best, not through our continuing but through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have hope. You know why? Because <laughs> we serve a risen Savior. <laughs> we stand in grace. Those Corinthians, over there in 1 Corinthians, you read those first 14 chapters, <laughs> they had a standing in God's grace independent of how good they were or how bad they were because it's not by works that we get saved and it's not by works that we have peace with God we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and now it's his grace that tugs at our heart to live a life that's pleasing to him and oh, what a, what a great message we have. They have a standing in grace. 
he was raised for our justification this is a new message to a new people by a new apostle and that we can have forgiveness now not in the future and we can have righteousness right now and stand in God's grace oh what a glorious thing we have and that he died for us too as Gentiles what does the cross mean to us or what does the resurrection mean to us? It means we can have total forgiveness because Jesus paid it all. And we can have righteousness given to our, our account as Gentiles when we trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And God makes us members of Jesus Christ and of the church which is his body. Back on the day of Pentecost, it was a Jewish church of the last days of Bible prophecy. Just a little commercial. We're, we're in unique times, and after this, this weekend, after Easter, we don't know how much longer we're going to be separated and restricted from coming together in our assembly. I'm going to begin to teach the second chapter of the book of Acts. Pick right up where we left off with our adult Sunday school class, because the second chapter of the book of Acts is key to clearly understanding what God was doing back there as compared to what he's doing now, today. We're, we were studying that in our adult Sunday school class until all of this broke loose. So commercial, Can join us in the next several weeks and we go through that key portion of scripture and look at what's taking place there, not what is read into it based on tradition and the way we've always thought what the Bible says. And we'll, we'll see some things. It's, it's critical, important. You, see, you need to recognize that today Christianity was a mystery in other ages not made known. Paul's gospel, the unique perspective, was a new message that God previously had hidden. He says in Corinthians, if I'd have made it known, the princes of this world would not have crucified the Lord of glory. <laughs> God had something up his sleeve. No, he had something in his heart, hidden in himself. He allowed Satan to, com to commit and to, to lead the Lord Jesus Christ right into that cross. And Satan had him crucified thinking he had won. But God raised him from the dead. And instead of wrath and vengeance and Israel's program continuing, God interrupted prophecy and saved Saul of Tarsus, made him Paul the Apostle, and his gospel now says, hey, the cross, that was part of God's plan all along, but it, he died for our sins as a fully satisfying sacrifice. And Paul makes that known. He even brings the 12 apostles up to speed on that message later in the book of Acts. Anyway, what does the cross mean for us? You're here in Romans. Go to Romans chapter number 8. We need to wrap this up and draw this to a conclusion. Uh, Romans chapter 8. Because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, we can have forgiveness, we can have righteousness, but we have hope. Romans 5 says we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That is a verse about resurrection. The image of his son is the resurrection body that the Lord Jesus Christ came, came up from the grave in a glorified state. And God has determined that because he rose from the dead, now we're going to one day have a resurrection body just like his. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians, because he lives, because the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, Paul's gospel offers hope and blessing to the Gentiles now. He says, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse 14, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. What does the resurrection mean to us? Well, because he was risen from the dead, he's the firstborn, he's the first fruits of more to follow. 
We're going to be raised and given a body just like his in the resurrection. Israel, too. He was the first fruits of their resurrection. Israel's got a resurrection. They're going to be resurrected and go into that kingdom. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and Moses and even all the way back to Adam and Job and Isaiah and Jer all those Old Testament prophets, they got resurrection. The Lord says, I'm the resurrection and the life. There was a resurrection for Israel. There's a resurrection for us too. A secret resurrection. Resurrection in the Bible is no mystery. There in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Oh, really? Who's the we? We Gentiles. We members of the body of Christ. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. There's a resurrection for us because the Lord was raised from the dead. We're going to be raised too. You're here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, or chapter 4. Look at chapter 5 and verse 1. Here's another one of those differences. Israel's hope was that everlasting kingdom on the earth. Our hope, our resurrection, has to do with some glory for us in the heavenly places. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we know, verse 1, that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands. Where? Eternal. Where? In the heavens. Our resurrection is, is and our house not made with hands is eternal in the heavens. When do we get that? We get that at his secret coming for us as members of the church, the body of Christ. With this new program, with this new program, and God raised up the church, the body of Christ, he put Israel's future kingdom and the second coming on hold temporarily while this new purpose is, is transpiring among the Gentiles. And just like the beginning of the age of grace was a secret, so is the end. The, end, the, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ for us is different from his coming for the nation of Israel. There is a secret coming called, we, we use the term, we have coined the term, the rapture of the church. He says, in, go there, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the resurrection for us means that there's going to be a, it's going to come at the secret coming. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. For, we, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ shall not prevent them which are asleep. See, he's coming, but this is not, I'm going to back this out, this coming that Paul talks about here is not his coming all the way back to the earth. It's a secret coming for a different group of people called the church, the body of Christ. He says in verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. You know who the dead in Christ are? It's the we, it's the, it's the Gentile believers that Paul was writing to there. We have a hope. Verse, six, verse 17 he says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught, notice it, up to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord in the air. We have a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The purpose for the body of Christ is that God would fill up the heavenly places with him, with redeemed members of his body. A glorious time. And so our 
See the two comings there, those are two comings that have to be rightly divided or you mix them up. All of the debate today about the timing of the Lord's return back to the earth and all of the prophetic events that, that are seen over in the Middle East or the, the, the pandemic in our country is not a sign of his return. That coming over there had signs associated with it, signs of a particular time that our apostle says we've been delivered from right here in Corinthians, not appointed unto wrath. God's going to take us out before he turns back and finishes his program here on the earth. Go to the book of Ephesians. Let's quit. Ephesians chapter number 2. What does the resurrection mean for us? It means we can have complete and total forgiveness now and peace with God and have his very righteousness put to our account. It means we have hope because the Lord Jesus Christ was raised. We're going to be raised and given a body just like his. It also means that we have glory in the future to look forward to. Ephesians chapter 2 is the great chapter on the, on the details of the gospel. He doesn't use the word gospel here, but he says in verses 1, 2, and 3 about our problem at being dead in trespasses and sins, walking according to the course of this world. This world's on a course. The things happening around us is nothing new. It's a course. Verse 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. You know who the us is? It's us Gentiles. It's the whole world. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. There's the new life we received when we trusted him. Quickened and raised with Christ to walk in newness of life. And, verse 6, hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's some glory to come. Verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. What a glorious future we have. Because he was raised, we have forgiveness, we have righteousness, we have hope of a resurrection, and some glory out there in the future. Don't get so hung up with all the stuff that's going on around us today. There's nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes says. But we have hope. We have a future. Keep our eyes on that. You know how we get it? He says, there's the gospel, verse 8. It's all because we believed. Verse 8, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's the gospel. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. And uh, he's Israel's Savior. He shed the blood of a, of a new covenant that enabled their sins to be blotted out in the future. We get all of that right now, up front, by God's grace. What a glorious thing we have. What a great thing to have hope in an uncertain world, uncertain times. Hope you know the Lord is your personal Savior. I know our folks, most of our folks, I know personally. Um, but if you're watching this video and you don't know for sure that your sins are forgiven, or you've wondered if maybe you haven't kept up with your faith, and maybe you're going through some hard times, and you're thinking, maybe, maybe I wasn't really saved. Listen, it's not about what you do. It's about you resting in what God did for you. And then he grabs a hold of you and puts you into living union with his son. And if we believe not yet, he abides faithful. You have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What a great thing to stand in God's grace. All because we received a gift. Trust him and receive that gift and have great hope in uncertain times. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time. And we trust that these things will be an encouragement in these uncertain times in which we live. We thank you. It's in Christ's precious name that we pray. Amen.